Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Ivology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. If you'd like to support the show, please rate and review the podcast wherever you can. Every like, comment, and subscribe really helps, and I greatly appreciate it. Today's episode is on a particularly fun and unique topic. The article is titled, Changes in Spiderwebs Brought About by Mescaline, Psilocybin, and an Increase in Body Weight, published in 1961. In hindsight, this would have been a great Halloween episode. Maybe I'll promote it again in October 2019. And on that note, hello to anyone listening to this in 2019 and beyond. I also wanted to mention that the researchers of the study come from the State University of New York, the sunny upstate medical university to be precise. I talked about this in an early episode, but personally, I really like being able to see what universities, past to present, have or currently conduct research into psilocybin. Part of it is just curiosity, but part of it is also that I feel like it's helpful to know if you're somewhat interested in going into the study of psychedelics. Knowing about the history of where this research comes from might help inform where we can continue to develop it. On that note, I just launched a new page on the website that is essentially a list of the universities that the authors of the studies we discuss have been affiliated with. You can check it out at silosavology.org. The page lists the universities alongside which episode they are essentially responsible for. I also just added an advocacy page, where I plan to highlight the organizations fighting for the decriminalization, the medicalization, or legalization of psilocybin. Right now, there's only two organizations on there, so if you know of more, please email me about them at silocybologist at gmail.com, and I'll add them to the page. Anyway, on to the topic for today. As you can tell from the title, this study examines both psilocybin as well as mescaline. Mescaline, for those who may not be familiar, is a psychedelic drug that has similar effects as LSD and psilocybin. It is naturally found in the peyote cactus, and importantly to these researchers, has also been shown to cause changes in how spiders build their webs. Given that mescaline impacts web building, and mescaline and psilocybin are both psychedelics, the researchers thought why not see if psilocybin also produces changes in web building. To add a bit more important background research, the authors also discussed how prior research has shown that as spiders grow up, some changes in web building are correlated with changes in the spider's weight, particularly during the later stages of their life, when they continue to get heavier but their legs stop getting longer, the American dream. This change in weight appeared to be correlated with fewer spiral turns and short radii in the webs. This paper, in addition to examining how mescaline and psilocybin affect web building, aimed to establish a causal link between increases in weight and decreases in the number of spiral turns and radii. The hypothesis is that a heavier spider has to build a thicker thread to hold its own weight, and that if there is only so much material available to make the web, the overall thread length of the web must be shorter to make up for it being a bit thicker. Another important finding that informed the study is that one of the authors, Peter Witt, who looks to have been the head of some spider web lab, referenced data in the introduction that a prior study showed spiders given psilocybin also appeared to make spider webs with a shorter thread length, as if the psilocybin made the spiders feel heavier than they were. Unfortunately, that preliminary study did not measure how thick the web was, which would support the hypothesis that psilocybin made spiders feel transiently heavier. The second aim of the study was, essentially, to test this hypothesis by measuring both web length and thickness after being given psilocybin and after being made heavier. How did the researchers make the spiders heavier, you might ask? Did they feed them a high-calorie diet? Did they restrict their mobility so they couldn't exercise? No. They adhered a piece of lead that was equal to 30% of the spider's weight on their back while they were held down with forceps. I don't read much research on spiderwebs, so I'm sure this might not be anything extraordinary to someone who works in a lab like this, but reading about this study was the highlight of my day. The methodology is just fascinating. Now on that note, I was also generally impressed with just how rigorous this research was. First, to make sure that the adhesive they used wasn't responsible for any of the web changes produced in the heavier spiders, they had a control condition where they just placed some adhesive on the spider's backs without the lead attached. In addition, they also conducted the study all year round to account for seasonal variation in web building. They conducted the study in a temperature regulated room to mimic natural light changes in temperature in coordination with timed light exposure. They also used each spider as their own control, 
taking measures of web building before, during, and after being placed in the psilocybin, mescaline, lead, or adhesive alone conditions. The next interesting question that you may already be asking is how did they give the spiders mescaline and psilocybin? Well, the researchers dissolved the drugs in water, added some glucose to make it taste sweet, and then they placed one, two, or three drops, each containing 0.01 milliliters of the solution, on the, quote, mouth parts of the spider, and watched to make sure they ingested all of it. The last part of the methods we need to discuss is how they assessed their primary outcome measures of thread length and thread thickness. For thread length, they actually referenced a formula that was developed by Dr. Walter Baum, who is possibly related to one of the authors, Dr. Ricardo Baum. I'll include the formula in the episode transcript, which you can find at the website psilocybology.org, but in essence it takes into account the number and length of the radii and the number of spiral turns in the web. The second measure, thread thickness, was reported as the amount of protein, in micrograms, present per meter of thread. To assess protein content, they actually digested the web so they could distill the ammonia to determine the nitrogen content. From there, they expressed the values as protein under the assumption that protein contains 16% nitrogen. Now, I was reading that there are some limitations with this assumption, but that that's also how they sometimes determine how much protein is in food, by determining the amount of nitrogen present. So finally, on to the results. Starting with the added weight condition, the researchers found that being 30% heavier significantly decreased the total thread length from about 16 meters to 11 meters. In alignment with their hypothesis, the spider's web also appeared to have gotten thicker. The protein content went from about 12 micrograms per meter of thread to 23 micrograms per meter of thread. Importantly, they also found that spiders that got just the adhesive but no lead did not change their web length or thickness, confirming that the changes seen in the weight condition was not a result of some unknown effect of the adhesive used. For psilocybin, our main event, they found the administration of 150 milligrams of psilocybin per kilogram of body weight, which I'll note is a very high dose of psilocybin, resulted in significantly shorter web length, going from an average length of 19 meters to an average length of 14 meters. This was not, however, accompanied by a statistically significant increase in thread thickness. In fact, there is even a trend in the opposite direction. This provides evidence that psilocybin does not, contrary to their hypothesis, cause spiders to behave as if they felt heavier. Now for mescaline, our final condition, they surprisingly did not measure thread thickness, only thread length. What they found, however, was that similar to both the weight and psilocybin conditions, spiders given mescaline produce webs with shorter thread length, going from about 14 meters to 10 meters on average. What's more interesting about the mescaline results is that they tested three different doses, 250 milligrams per kilogram body weight, 500 milligrams per kilogram body weight, and 1,000 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Somewhat shockingly, they only found effects at the 1,000 milligram per kilogram body weight dose, which is a very high dose of mescaline. Granted, I'm sure it's not fair to compare the effective dose ranges in humans with that of spiders. Still, the researchers actually comment that based on this study, they would estimate that psilocybin is about seven times more potent than mescaline. If you just listened to episode 10, you'll remember that based on very rough estimates of dose ranges for mescaline and psilocin from Psychonaut Wiki, psilocin is about 10 to 20 times as potent as mescaline. If we also remember that psilocin is about 1.4 times as potent as psilocybin, then the claim in this paper that psilocybin is about 7 times as potent as mescaline doesn't actually appear to be very far off. I thought that was really interesting. So in addition to the primary measures, the researchers did also look at two other outcomes, the regularity of angles in the web, as well as web building frequency. Comparing mescaline and psilocybin, they found that while spiders given mescaline produced webs that were significantly more irregular in shape than the webs of control spiders, spiders given psilocybin showed no changes in regularity. The reverse was found when it came to web frequency. Psilocybin appeared to decrease, and as the dose increased, completely suppress web building, whereas mescaline did not. This actually reminded me of some really early episodes of the podcast where researchers found that people given psilocybin attempted fewer arithmetic problems. It seems like psilocybin might not impact the ability to do certain tasks. After all, when the spiders did build a web, it looked regularly shaped. It simply might decrease the drive to do certain tasks in the first place. I also want to note that just like the formula for calculating thread length, 
I'll actually include all of the figures in the transcript as well, so you can see what the spiderwebs looked like if you're curious. The example spiderweb built while on psilocybin looks sort of like a shield to me, and it's actually kind of pretty. Well, that's it for today's episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the show, please let me know. You can find out all the ways to reach me on the website, psilocybology.org. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.